Welcome to the Star of Grind. My background, software developer, and uh, did custom software for enterprise clients for many years. I started two software companies, and as I like to say, in 2007, went to the dark side and became a venture capitalist at GRP Partners. We are a Los Angeles-based investor, but we invest nationwide. So first, I want to talk about the early days of a company. And when you first start, the co-founder discussion, because that's probably the most fundamental thing about building teams. And if you could use a building analogy, it would be this. If you build a building on bad foundations, and you're three levels up, and then later on you raise a bunch of money to finish floors eight, nine, and 10, if you got floors zero, one, two, three wrong, uh, you're probably going to have a lot of time, a uh, hard time actually scaling that building ultimately. So the co-founder thing matters a lot. Now, as an investor, what do I look at? Every investor has a different breakdown in terms of team, product, market, but these are the kind of three things we all talk about. My own bias is about 70% team. And I'll tell you very clearly why that's my bias. Now, I, I'm not saying zero product and market, because every time I say this, people say, well, how could you invest if it's not a good product? I'm assuming it's a great product. But if it's an amazing product and I'm not convinced about the team, I'm not going to invest. End of story. If I think there's a huge market opportunity to fundamentally change education, healthcare, travel, whatever, I'm not going to invest if it's not a great team. And there's a reason for that is so much happens to you when you start a business in the first few years, and all of it is unexpected. Apple announces they're going to compete with your company. Google announces they're going to compete with your company. Somebody writes a terrible review on your website, and you're called Airbnb, and suddenly there's a meme called Ransatgate. Your co-founder leaves. And maybe that gets positive press. Maybe it gets terribly negative press. The market conditions change. You thought you were going to be able to raise $10 million, and then September 2008 comes along. You can't anticipate any of these things. And any of these things, and most likely all of these things, are going to happen to you. So as I kind of say, shit happens. And great teams are much better at handling adversity and figuring out what to do next. So that's why it's so important to me. And I think in Silicon Valley in particular, we over-memorialize the co-founders because we have you know, Jerry and David and Chad and Steve and Larry and Sergey. And that's the vision we have in our minds. And that's the vision that Silicon Valley perpetuates. And there's a really big problem with this because it's actually called selection bias, where you end up with a certain set of data, and then you make decisions based on a smaller set of data, and then extrapolate it to the whole. And I believe that this is the reality of most startups. <laughs> and I'm not joking. And the problem with most startups is this is the thing nobody can write about. No blogger can come online and say, you know what? My co-founders are fighting. It's a terrible situation. And we're trying to resolve it. And even when things don't end up working out, either because of confidentiality clauses or just mensch policies, people don't really want to badmouth people. And I'll just say it because I don't know the inside details and I'm not making any commentary. But if you look at Foursquare and you look at Dennis and Naveen, I believe his name is, and Naveen left the company, like it doesn't just happen because there's two bros and everything's getting along, but I just decided to do something else. It just doesn't happen that way. And again, I'm not pointing fingers or saying why it happened. I'm just saying it's a lot more common than you think. And you're about to go on a five to eight year journey or maybe longer, and you're going to put in your time, energy, reputation, you're taking risk financially from other opportunities you have. And it feels to me like this is something people ought to care about, is having a degree more control. And I like to tell people that you get a huge premium for taking the leap. And if you take the leap, you can often recruit co-founders. What does it mean to recruit co-founders? If you're 
deeply technical and you don't think you can be CEO, but you build an amazing product, you can bring in a CEO, hand them 30%, 40%, 50%, 60% of the company, but you can still retain voting control. If you are a CEO and you hire a tech co-founder, you can hire that tech co-founder for 5% or 50%. I'm not making a value judgment on equity, but on control. And I like to say, I know you're gonna hire co-founders and you're gonna start a business with two or three or four of you anyways, no matter how many times I tell people not to. So just at least make sure you thought through the prenuptials. How is this gonna end if you fall out of love? And um, marriage, I guess, is what, about 50% divorce rates? Like, founders, like falling out of love is probably higher than that. I also tell people, you grind me because you want to protect yourself from 1% or 2% more dilution. So instead of raising at a 7 pre, you want to raise at a 7.2 pre. And you spend all this time fighting me over this. And then you give two-thirds away of your company to two other people before you even started. Just think about it. Just think about the math of where you fight. And I'm not saying to be um, greedy with equity. I've never said that. Just think about the control and how these things play out. And people think, well, VCs want me to have co-founders, and I just don't agree with that. They just don't articulate it properly to you. VCs want a team. They don't want a weak link. They don't want to feel like if something goes wrong with one individual, my investment is gone. They don't really care, in my opinion, if you have a good company, whether or not you founded it and brought in three other people later, whether you own 40% of the company or 70% of the company. They don't want to see somewhere where you've got five people at the very start of the company who each own less than 1% each and one person who owns 95 because we know that's a recipe for not likely to succeed. We want a team and the structure matters. I'm just saying I don't believe the mythology that we have to start it together 50-50 necessarily holds as much as other people think so. So getting on to the more interesting stuff, how do you build an early stage team? This is my preference, this is my bias. I like to see a CEO and four or five engineers and designers and nothing else. And as I said on my blog post, and all these slides are available on my blog today, and you can download them from SlideShare, and I put little links at the bottom where you can read more details on each topic that I've written about. But I made it very clear when I wrote about this, I'm open to other configurations. Most companies don't look like this. This is just the direction of what I prefer to see at the start. And I'd like to see a CEO who is product-centric. If at this stage the person's coming into me and can't demo the product, can't do wireframes, can't talk about customer needs, I'm not going to invest. Those are the old days. Those are the 90s where a CEO was, their, their best skill set was PowerPoint. Um, and, you know, I really care about that CEO's ability to lead and attract talent, because I believe that's going to matter for this company to be successful. Some pet peeves for me. Um, I'm probably not going to invest if you outsourced your development. I'm probably not going to invest if you hired a consulting firm to build your core product. Trust me, I've heard every explanation of why people do that. Well, we just want to get to market faster, and I got all this stuff going, and I got the engineers, and I'm going to hire them. Maybe other people will fund that, I won't. I believe it's vital in a tech startup for the DNA of the company to be tech. And I believe Silicon Valley greatly underestimates the importance of business acumen. So don't read me wrong when I'm saying I want tech DNA. I care about marketing, I care about sales, I care about business development, I care about finance. I care way more about product management than most people in Silicon Valley. I'm just saying the DNA has to be technical. Um, if you have tons of business people, and I get this a lot in LA, unsurprisingly, the startup that has like six biz devy kind of people and two engineers, um, the, the biggest problem with that is not that those six people aren't talented, they probably are, but you're assuming a cost base of a company 
before your product is complete or complete enough and before there's product market fit. So that's not a good recipe for me. And I really don't give a shit about your advisory board. So really, like people will come and they'll pitch and they'll spend 10 minutes telling me how great everyone on their advisory. I have never seen an advisory board that fundamentally made or broke a company. And it's just not worth playing up. It's okay to have a slide and put up the famous names of the people you gave a quarter point to to put their name on that slide. And that's probably the most value you'll ever get. Um, but just put it up, show it, be proud, and move on. And you don't need to say a lot about it. Um, Seth Sternberg had this saying. He said that short people like to work with short people and tall people like to work with tall people. And I think there's some truth to that. Metaphorically, um, introverted people are more s attracted to working with introverted people. Very technical introverts are attracted to technical introverts. You know, the gregarious, biz devy type of people are more attracted to those kind of people. Hey, bro. You know, they, uh, you, you get those kind of like similar types of people, but the thing in a startup is you need diversity of skills. You need that gregarious people who's out at the conferences shaking hands, kissing babies, getting you know, people's attention. And you need the people who are more introverted and thoughtful and thinking about the business. And so I just encourage people to think carefully about what your skills are and what your weaknesses are and interview to type. And I'll just tell you myself, I'm what I call a shaper. I'm reasonably good at conceptualizing coming up with ideas, getting people excited about those ideas. I can get ideas with a degree of specificity so they're not just hot air. But when I move a, an idea along, there's the 500 things that take to make that into reality, and I'm not so good at that. And it's not a cop-out. I'm just not good at it. I think it's part of the fact that I'm ADD and I know people use that very loosely, but I actually think a lot of entrepreneurs are clinically ADD. And ADD, if you read about it, and if you think you might have it, there's a book called Driven from Distraction that I always recommend to people. There's a lot of high performance that comes with ADD. And I don't think people should shy away from that, but there's also a negative side to it. And that negative side is completing and finishing. So when I interview for me, I'm looking for completer finishers. It matters a lot to me, and I have a lot of those people in my life, as my wife likes to tell me, including herself. <laughs> so diversity matters. Um, I also think that Silicon Valley has created this mythology around Mark Zuckerberg. And I don't mean just him, let's say Larry Page too. Like we've had such a great run in Silicon Valley of engineering-led companies, and that's wonderful. But again, I worry that we've got the wrong conclusion from this all. That engineers rule the roost and that product management is something that should be subjugated to engineering. And I just don't believe it. Because I'm from LA, I like to use a Hollywood metaphor. You cannot build a great movie without a great writer. You can have a great movie that sells a lot if you have great special effects. But you can't build a, gr a truly great, high-quality movie without a great writer. But a great writer doesn't necessarily know how to cast his movie or her movie. A great writer doesn't necessarily know how to market her movie. A great writer doesn't necessarily know how to keep things on budget or what other films in that genre are coming out and at which places to launch and so on and so forth. So the creative genius of that person is also combined with the creative genius of actors and directors and post-production and sound and distributors and marketers, and yes, business executives in suits who do have to, have to make decisions about how to monetize. And so I like to say if your customer's at your right and your engineer's at your left, and we know what the glamorous engineer does, and I also put them on a pedestal because I can't imagine greatness happening without a writer. The product manager is the person who captures customer requirements and figures out whether or not customers are willing to pay for a product and tests that and looks at competition and pricing and you know, prioritizes the roadmap and helps 
work on the differences between what the techies want to do, which is usually techie stuff, and what the sales and marketing and customers want to do, which is usually not techie stuff, and what operations and customer support want done, which is usually not what the customers want done. And like product management is so important in startups, and I worry that we've deprecated that as a community. And I hate to see that. And I got to tell you, those same writers who are our creative geniuses, just like in Silicon Valley, many of them are recluse and don't love to spend time with customers and just want to work on what they're good at. And I'm not saying every, it's not 100% stereotype, but let's be mindful of it, that there might actually be a better individual who can judge what customers want and need. Many investors have a bias towards over-experience. You put three million bucks in a company, five million bucks in a company, and the very first thing you do is you say, now we need an XVP from Salesforce.com or an SVP from Oracle or whatever. And my advice to you is don't take their advice. I like to hire people who punch above their weight class. I want to hire the marketing person who wanted to be CMO but didn't get the opportunity, who's hungry to do it, who's hungry to prove themselves. I want the person who got passed over as CEO. They were running biz dev, the CEO got sacked, they raised their hand, they say, look at all these deals that I've done. And the VCs say, yeah, but you've never been a CEO. Well, how the fuck can you be a CEO if no one lets you be a CEO? It just doesn't work that way. Um, note to self, say fuck, get claps. Okay. <laughs> Let's make sure I don't learn the wrong conclusion from that. But for real, I'm not talking about lower quality people. I'm just talking about less experienced people. And let's be honest, for your little tiny startup, you are way more likely to get someone who hasn't yet done the role and the reason they're joining you is because they want the opportunity than you are to get the person who was 12 years at Adobe as an SVP. Like if they're joining your company, it's kind of like the Groucho Marx saying, you know, would never want to be part of a club that would accept me as a member. Like, why is this person joining your company, right? Uh, aside from your personal dynamism. Uh, I like to talk about sales a lot. And I think also a mistake we make is the right-hand side, which is I want people who have a bunch of relationships. Like again, it goes back to the culture of Silicon Valley. I've got engineers and product managers and I'm introverted and I don't know how to do this sales thing and I, you know, I don't want to talk to these people. And so you imagine, you visualize this person who's like a relationship person that's just going to ring the cash register. The problem is in most startups you don't have perfect product market fit. And part of the sales process is you sitting in front of customers, hearing what they have to say, getting the feedback, adjusting constantly based on that feedback. It's a very consultative process. I call it evangelical sales because you're going to people and trying to persuade them of problems they have but they don't know that they have and they don't know that they need a solution. And that skill set is very different. I think relationship-based selling matters tremendously when you're ready to scale a company. In the early days, I would be very careful of it. Um, I put up a chart for engineering. This is something that comes up with almost all companies I work with, is we have this idea of almost a unified individual called a head of engineering, and they can do everything because they're Superman or Superwoman. The reality is there's three distinct skill sets you're looking for in your engineering team. So on the x-axis, I have technical capability. On the y-axis, I have process orientation. The person who is very technical over on the right, but not as good at process, is what I might call the CTO or chief architect. They're very good at technology. But to build a great tech team and a great tech product, you need to manage a bunch of other people. And you need to make decisions about what to ship and how to ship and when to ship. And I call that person who's very technical but very process oriented, a VP of engineering. They do code reviews and quality reviews and they figure out the balance of carrot and stick and, and they, um, they can do planning and estimating. 
Now, there are people that are important as your team grows who are not technical, but they are process ninjas. I am not one of them. But every team needs these people. And they are called program managers. You're probably not going to have them in the early days of your startup, but they're very important to think about the three skills that you need. Many startups have five people, the CEO, the COO, the president, the CTO, and some other person, an engineer. And I just don't get it. Like, OK, well, if you're president and you're COO, what does your CEO do? Like, I, what I feel is it's the greatest fudge that exists in a startup. OK, you guys entrusted me to be CEO, and I kind of feel bad about that, so we'll call you president. And that's fine when you start, when no one really has titles. But as you grow, it creates a lot of confusion in your staff. Hierarchy exists for a reason. And I'm not saying build like this deeply hierarchical structure, but I believe it's really important that you have functional roles and responsibilities and accountability. So I can't say to the president, why didn't you ship product? And he says, well, I'm president. I'm not CTO. Like, OK, well, what is president responsible for? Um, when you go A to B round, and there's only a few more slides, so I promise I'm not going to overrun. One of the first thing I tell people, if you raise $3 million, $4 million, and you're starting to hire more staff, the very first person I would hire if I was you is an admin. And the admin can double as office manager or accounts or whatever. And again, I know we have this culture that says you shouldn't have admins because that's something that you have in Hollywood. And when I see CEOs booking their travel, booking meetings, dealing with minutia admin, figuring out like HR policy planning stuff, all I can think is you are supposed to be the most valuable person in the company and you're doing those tasks which there are many talented people who are not CEO could be doing. And it, it's called leverage. And I think, again, we have this culture you're not supposed to ask for that kind of help. The other place that you get the same leverage is VP of Finance. And often with the VP of Finance, you get someone who not only does the books, but they can do your HR, they can do your office space, they can help you with legal stuff. And fundamentally, they can help you with fundraising. And they can help you prepare board packs. And all these things that are very important but very time consuming because the CEO has to do lots of things. Um, so those are two roles that people underinvest in early that I wish they didn't. And this is the last, which is uh, board construction. So unsurprisingly, I believe you should limit the number of VCs on your board. You don't get incrementally more value by going from one VC to four VCs. You just get more opinions. So it is good to have VCs on your board. I don't think that's a terrible thing. I would just be careful about not being VC heavy. Number two, a board observer is the exact same thing as a board member. I want to say it again. A board observer equals board member. So you accept three board observers because a lot of people feel like they want to be on your board and you fudge and you don't make the hard call, so be an observer. Nothing gets decided by vote at a board meeting. Nothing, zero, zero, absolutely nothing, except in one situation where things are absolutely horrible, like we're going to fire you. I'm not joking. Like That's the kind of thing that goes to a vote. Or should we be acquired? Those kind of decisions might go for a vote because people might disagree. Everything else is consensus driven. Therefore, those three observers, if they're the loudest people in the room, might have more influence on your board than the person who wrote a check and owns 30% of your company. And it's mind boggling to me how we let this happen. I learned that from experience. I had board observers. There are cases where board observers can be OK. Again, on the presentation on my blog on both sides of the table, I've actually linked to how I think you should think about board observers. Uh, and if I think you should also limit management on the board. It makes things very difficult as the CEO when you have two co-founders, maybe head of marketing, head of tech. And if you ever get into tough decisions about how to change the company or that person isn't performing as well, 
it is very difficult over time to ask them to step off the board or to you know, change the construct. So what I like to say is that doesn't mean you have to give up control. You could, for example, bring some startup CEOs to be on your board, and wouldn't it be nice to have a peer on your board who's been through what you're going through, maybe one year ahead or two years ahead? And you can retain the legal right to that board seat. So in the case of a vote, you can control the vote. You're not giving up control. I think too many VCs and too much management creates awkward uh, board structures. And then finally, I really like independence on the board. And what I like to say for independence are make them write a small check because you want them committed. $25,000, whatever isn't a major commitment for them, just enough that they feel like they're part of the team. Um, that's all I got. Good luck.